Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Carson just said, uh, I'm Amesha, and I'm um, MLFPM ESR under the supervision of Antonio Artes at the Carlos III University of Madrid. In this talk, I would like to present the work I've done during the past three years. Uh, first, I will talk about the concept of digital phenotyping, its promises when applied to the mental health field and the challenges that working with uh, such data sources present. And then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, show you some applications um, that we worked on uh, where we try to predict mental health outcomes based on uh, the digital phenotypes. So let's start by defining the context. So the use of um, digital technologies to better understand individuals and uh, groups or even society itself remains quite a, a key topic across different fields. And as a result, um, several terms have emerged in these fields that sometimes um, generate a hype or a fear and overpromise things. Uh, for example, the terms digital trace, digital footprint, um, which are common in humanities, social and computer sciences, uh, arose alongside the digitized or quantified self as well. And more recently, uh, medicine has introduced the term of digital phenotyping, which um, basically appears to promise the ability to track biological, physical, and behavioral traits using uh, smartphones and fitness trackers. Um, and well, digital phenotyping promises significant benefits when applied to the medical field. For psychiatry, for example, which um, has up till now mainly re relied on um, episodic reports um, collected on site with the clinician during appointments. Digital phenotyping offers this um, powerful approach to systematically detect behavioral states of patients, um, maybe even subtype current heterogeneous uh, diagnostic categories and measure outcomes. For neurology, where measuring cognitive tools is quite uh, cognitive function is quite expensive. It offers uh, an inexpensive ecological assessment tool in real world setting. So as it de uh, delivers this, let's say, rich data source, um, it opens up a new field and new possibilities to reconfigure the delivery of healthcare, both for the patient, uh, from the patient's perspective and the perspective of doctors. So the workflow of digital phenotyping consists of several steps, which can be broken down to two main things. The first uh, part is acquiring the data and um, then analyzing this data. And as these data sources are very complex, multidimensional and temporal, um, the let's say most more suitable or um, yeah, the most suitable technologies for them um, will be machine learning applications. So, um, yes, these technologies, even though sound very promising, um, face a series of challenges which can, which can come from either the data collection or the data analysis perspective. From when we talk about data collection in digital phenotyping, there are two categories. There is active data collection and passive data collection. Active data refers to anything that requires the user's input. For example, filling in questionnaires, uh, leaving um, diary entries, or um, rating their sleep. Um, and passive data is generally anything that is collected uh, by the sensors of the phone or, or any device without requiring an input from the user. Now, the problem with um, active data collection is that users um, tend to um, <laughs> like consider it a burden over time, and uh, it's very hard to uh, keep them engaged uh, in the studies or, or well, in a clinical setting. 
Um, then, of course, there is the issue of, of privacy and data security. Some of this information that is collected can be um, directly linked to the person, such as their phone number uh, in some cases, or even their location information. So these are things that have to be uh, handled uh, using corresponding techniques. And then when we go to the data analysis perspective, we can see that well, since we are using different sensors of these devices, um, the data is very heterogeneous. We have real value data, we have categorical information. And also due to sensor failure or um, other collection errors, sometimes the values that we are recording are uh, outliers. Like you can see, for example, on the uh, bottom left uh, plot uh, for the step count, sometimes we end up with values in like two millions, which well <laughs> would be quite uh, impossible for someone to perform two million steps in a day, right? Um, so as these are um, challenges in the data that, that we have to deal with. And uh, also uh, there are a lot of missing observations uh, which can be due to sensor failure or behavioral aspects of the patient. Like if someone, um, I don't know, turns off their phone for the night or for the weekend, then we don't collect data for a very long time. Uh, but we have no way of knowing why this is happening. Um, okay, so for uh, with these in mind, I would like to go to the second part of my talk where um, I will show some applications. Um, so during my PhD, I basically worked on three main topics in mental health. One was mood prediction, one was anxiety prediction, and the last project was uh, functionality prediction using uh, digital biomarkers. And uh, the data that we used for this work uh, comes from two ongoing clinical studies in Madrid. And uh, for the mobile sense data collection, uh, the EB2 tool uh, is used while the clinicians use a tool called MeMind to record um, information about the patients and also the outcomes of their, um, like, for example, questionnaires or evaluations. Um, so in the first project, uh, we worked on a generic machine learning based approach for emotional state prediction using only passively collected data from um, well, mobile phones and wearables. And um, as a target outcome, self-reported emotions by patients. So this topic is quite uh, important in mental health because uh, changes uh, in emotional state or uh, long periods of, of very negative emotional state can be indicative of um, a worsening um, um, yeah, like disease evolution or um, like, um, yeah, for onset of um, depressive phases, for example. And uh, if these are caught in time, then we can intervene and um, help patients uh, before things get very hard. So for this project, um, we used, uh, uh, well, the listed data sources, so step count, a distance um, indicators, whether the patient practice sport during the day or not, how much they sleep, how much time they spend at home or using their phone, and then the self-reported emotions. And we had a cohort of about 940 patients that had at least 30 days worth of data recorded uh, at that point, and uh, also um, well, we wanted them to have at least recorded once an emotion. Uh, to represent the emotions on a lower dimensional level, we used um, this two-dimensional mapping that is commonly um, used in psychiatry, uh, where we map the emotions based on their uh, valence, so whether they are negative or positive, and based on their intensity, which is um, called arousal here. And as you can see on the plot on the left, uh, the 
um, in the data set, most of the reported emotions uh, belong to the negative category, which is um, well, quite expected with uh, mental health patients. Um, so in the overall data set, uh, we had over 170,000 uh, entries or samples. But as you can see on this graph, uh, the data was quite sparse. There were sometimes long chunks of missing. Um, overall, it was about 80%, um, like 80% 80 of the observations was partial and it was around 5% only that was complete, meaning that for a day we had information for a specific patient for every variable that we are tracking. Um, and moreover, the emotions, because it was self-reported, so the patients were not uh, forced or like coerced in any way to introduce emotions. Um, well, some patients tend to do it more often, right? That, that like to keep track of their mental health, others maybe less. And um, we ended up with only about 10% of the data being labeled. So um, even though we started with a quite large data set, in the end, uh, we lost quite some of it. Um, so to deal with the missing data, which was the first challenge we had to tackle here, we decided to use uh, generative models, uh, namely hidden Markov models and mixture models, which uh, learn the underlying patterns in the data and are able to um, like learn even the distributions even in the presence of missing data by marginalizing out with regards to the other variables. And um, we trained these models in a semi-supervised setting because we wanted to um, enforce the, the states of the model uh, to recognize the different emotional states that we were considering. So this means that um, some of the states of the HMM uh, would always emit negative emotions and some would always emit positive emotions, for example. Um, and this way we managed to link the emotion better with the uh, behavioral data. And after we train these models, we use them to um, impute the missing values before performing classification. And how we did this was uh, that we found the most probable state sequence for our observation sequence for a patient based on um, their behavioral data, leaving out the emotion information, and uh, then generated samples from the most probable states to fill in the missingness. Um, moreover, we also experimented with including the latent representation provided by these models as additional features um, for our classifiers. And um, yeah, we tried different temporal and um, non-temporal models. So um, we compared classical machine learning applications such as logistic regression, support vector machines with um, uh, or NNB temporal models. And we also um, defined a hierarchical regression model to try to better capture the individual differences um, between patients. And um, yeah, it's a short summary of the results. So um, we achieved, um, well, in some cases, larger than 70% um, area under the rock curve in um, the three class and five, five class problems. And as you can see, including the posteriors uh, significantly increased the performance. Um, and also, yes, we found that accounting for these individual differences using the hierarchical model, we could um, gain a bit uh, on performance, but, um, but the results were comparable to these. Um, okay. And then in a second project, which was a collaboration with uh, psychiatrists from the Mount Sinai in New York, we aim to evaluate the usage patterns of social media and communication um, data uh, from patients uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown period in Madrid. So it was a, a short, short, relatively short period. 
and uh, we wanted to relate this to their uh, anxiety symptoms that were measured using the seven item uh, general anxiety disorder scale. And um, well, we had a small cohort of only 95 patients here. From the mobile sense data side, we focused, as I said, on social media and communication app use. And uh, alongside these, we wanted to include other covariates that were relevant for anxiety uh, in this situation, such as um, information about whether the patients were exposed to COVID, if they were living with someone else who was an essential worker, um, and um, if, yeah, like the perception of threat regarding their jobs, like losing their jobs and so on. Um, so uh, as a, when, when like looking at the data, um, we could see already that there was, um, there were different patterns emerging in the, in the temporal uh, data. And there was also quite a, a, a non-uniform distribution in the other features that we considered. Uh, and given the small data set, we wanted to uh, keep it simple and try to find a way to like combine this multimodal data um, into a relatively easy and interpretable model. Um, yeah, so as I said here, the target outcomes were, were um, the GED7 scores that the clinicians recorded via phone calls after the lockdown. And this is basically a seven item questionnaire where um, patients like score how they feel in certain situations. And um, we define the cutoff at um, 10 indicating um, like, like based on literature, because 10 is kind of a, a diagnostic value for screening. So um, um, yeah, like agreeing with psychiatrists, this seemed to be a good uh, cutoff. And uh, we applied a simple pipeline where we reused this idea of having a hidden Markov model uh, modeling the temporal data. Uh, but here, because we wanted to reduce uh, the temporal data into a feature vector, we actually aggregated the state posterior probabilities that we found for every sequence and concatenated that with uh, the covariates that we were considering to then um, perform the classification with a simple linear regression. Um, we tried more complex nonlinear models, but uh, they improved, like there was no improvement. So um, this also gave some explainability. Um, moreover, an interesting thing that we found was that uh, a three state HMM uh, captured like uh, quite uh, interesting patterns in the data. So, um, yeah, I don't know how well you can see what's up there, but um, we found that, um, for example, state three um, decoded the parts in the data where uh, there was a low communication app use uh, and I think average, uh, yes. So the, yeah, <laughs> like average uh, social um, usage. Uh, while the other states uh, were capturing the more extreme values. And when decoding the sequences, we saw that state three actually um, was usually linked to those periods when there, where there were no observations for a more consecutive time. Um, and then I still have one minute. <laughs> so I will quickly um, wrap this up. So the last... Um, project uh, I've worked on was um, trying to predict uh, declining functionality. Um, and here we also wanted to opt for um, multimodal approach where we combine the temporal observations of um, mobility descriptor variables and uh, some social demographic information. Uh, here talking to clinicians um, and, and following their advice, we included covariates such as uh, patient age, um, gender, their employment status, and uh, cohabiting status. And um, 
Yes, so again, <laughs> we have the same overview of a data with a lot of missingness. Um, here, the temporal sequences were represented as uh, half hour windows for uh, every feature. So basically, uh, a day is captured in 48 um, slots of, of these uh, windows. And well, the, our outcome of interest was the mobility domain of the um, World Health Organization Disability As Assessment Schedule, um, which um, asks patients if they had difficulty performing a given set of tasks in the past 30 days, and then um, they get an overall score. The higher the score, the higher level of disability they have. Um, we again categorize this and um, we, uh, here the cutoff is at 25% where we uh, consider like the a healthy cohort people with less than 25% disability and everyone uh, else was put together in the, um, yeah, in the impaired cohort. Um, most patients only had uh, one entries, only about 400 had two, but out of these 400 patients, only 50 had actually a change in the score during the period of the observations. So um, yeah, it, it was a bit tricky. And here we applied a deep learning pipeline where um, well, once again, we used the, the well-working HMM approach uh, to impute first the missing values. And then um, once we had the, the imputed temporal sequences, we work um, uh, with a pipeline constructed of um, uh, basically some LSTM layers and attentions. Um, the, in, we included the attentions because we wanted to gain some insight into the important patterns for patients and uh, we wanted to be able to compare uh, what are the temporal patterns that the model would pay attention to more, um, for example, for a healthy or, a, or a, um, an impaired patient. And then, uh, well, after we extract uh, these like encodings or embeddings of the temporal data, we concatenated it with um, um, the social demographic information to hear the predictions. Um, and our preliminary results um, were somewhat low, but um, promising. Um, we tested the model uh, on a different uh, cohort of patients and it did not uh, manage to generalize very well but um, yeah the uh, as you can see for example on, on those plots uh, the the important patterns uh, in the data like vary between patients and this is something that uh, we still want to look into um, yeah and okay um, yeah, I had two like sentences about uh, ethical problems uh, with this kind of research. So um, we have to keep in mind that uh, we are talking about the mental health of patients. And this is um, um, yeah, kind of a field that can easily be abused. And uh, there are certain yeah, aspects that um, have to be considered uh, for, for safety and um, um, yeah, but uh, as I'm running out of time, thank you very much. These are my collaborators, and uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, some of the rest. Thank you for Would like to start? Maybe I have a, was this a raised hand? No. Okay, <laughs> I'm starting to hallucinate. <laughs> <laughs> so my lab is working a lot on another type of time series, ICU um, data sets from intensive care, uh, which seems very similar, at, at least on an abstract level, to what you're modeling. So have you thought about uh, applying these techniques to intensive care data sets like uh, MIMIC or EICU? Yes, uh, well, actually, um, in a small experiment during uh, my secondment at Siemens, uh, I tried uh, using the HMMs for 
um, electric health record data. So it was lab measurements as well. And um, yes, they did not seem to work that well, especially in the case when uh, the time between measurements is, is very large. Um, it, and like, of course, the different, uh, for example, lab values there were collected at different time intervals. Here, the time intervals are more, more aligned because we have this summary of daily <clears throat> or half hourly behavior. So that makes it a bit easier. So these these time periods are quite nicely behaving. They are regular and not so sparse. Yes, and, uh, yes, like frequency wise, yes. Even though there is a lot of missing, but like the yeah, in in theory we have always these forty eight time yeah. slots or yeah. Good. Is there another question comment? If not, then we thank Amesha again for her talk.